Good morning. How's everyone doing? Good. Shout out Santa Ana. Who's from Santa Ana? All right. Me and her. <laughs> Representing the inland of New York. Yep. Oakland. Garden Grove. <laughs> Anybody from Westminster here? <laughs> there we go. <laughs> well, I'm glad you guys are here. It's awesome. We're going to continue our uh, study in persevering in faith um, and wrap that up. And I uh, want to give you a little bit of understanding of our journey because it's really a perseverance in faith. Faith starts... And it starts in all of our lives when we believe God is who he says he is. That's the beginning. When people came to the Lord today, it's really at that place of believing that he is who he says he is. And then as we begin to grow, we begin to realize that in faith that we believe God is good. How many believe God is good? Then faith goes to another level when we seek God that goodness because life throws us a bunch of ups and downs. And that starts to change our understanding of God's goodness. How can he be good when this is happening? And that's where hope starts to kick in in realizing that God has promised that he'll work everything out for good. So our hope enables us to persevere in faith until that starts to happen. And that doesn't necessarily happen even in this life. How many of us have had every dream fulfilled and we're just waiting to go home <laughs> to heaven? We're still on journey. How many know that God is still doing a work in your life to do a work through your life? How many know that our faith is marched out on a day-to-day -day basis? How many know that sometimes... On a personal level, I have faith that moves mountains. And on other times, I have faith that you couldn't find under a sesame seed. But what I have learned is to persevere. And the great thing about that is I only have to do it today. And I have to trust God today. Because if I start looking to the future, a lot of us get anxiety filled. How many of us have catastrophic catastrophic imaginations when we think of the future. Why is that? How many of us, when we think of the future, go, it's going to be glorious. I am going to succeed in this thing. I'm going to do well. Well, a lot of it is because we have been fed, like Chris was saying earlier, from the time we were little. We haven't been given words of life. We've been given words that lead to death. You'll not become this. Don't do that. There's no money in it. You're stupid. You know, how, one of the beautiful things in Scripture is when Moses was teaching the people, he said, you need to give them hope for the future. Hope for the future. That needs to be planted in us. And oftentimes, a single word from somebody that gets, speaks life into us is life-changing. How many of us have turned around a certain part of our life when someone said, I believe in you. I believe you can do this. I believe you can move forward. I believe your past doesn't define you. It's part of you. Not sure what he said, but it was good. Huh? Was it good? <laughs> okay. So faith really is about living God's direction or obeying God's direction one day at a time. So what does persevering in faith look like? How, how do we have an example of that? Well, in Hebrews 11, we're told that all the ancients or the people of old that walked with God are examples to us that we may walk with God in our generation. So it's always good to do a little bit of a study on a person in the Old Testament, the people of old, who the beautiful thing is we get usually a snapshot of their whole life, not just a little comma, a little quotation marks of a part of their life. 
And we get to see how they lived and how they walked out faith and didn't. I love the Bible for this reason. It doesn't paint people as they aren't. It paints them as they are. And those paintings which are realistic also encompass their strengths, their weaknesses, their successes, their failures. It paints it all. Why? Because God's the hero. He's the one that accomplishes in them way beyond what they could accomplish. So we're going to take a look today at at a man named Joshua. And Joshua lived during a very hard time for the people of his generation. In fact, he's the last generation to enter or begin the journey into the land that God had promised hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years earlier. Many, many, many generations earlier, and God told them numerous times that he was going to give them a land of their own out of all the earth, which belongs to God, but is also under the control of the enemy. And because it's under the control of the enemy, the enemy uses people to do evil. When we see evil all around, that's the work of the enemy, and the enemy wants to control the planet. So God said after he made it and after the fall and everything that I am going to take a little portion of this back as the example of what I'm ultimately going to do in destroying the enemy. How many know that when you read the Old Testament, sometimes it's like there's war after war. God's killing people left and right. This thing, I don't get it all. Well, you need to understand something. God is full of grace and full of love. But there is also judgment. He judges evil. And evil has to be removed. There comes a point. And in fact, in Genesis, I believe it's 15, he told Abraham that he, the, the Canaanites, their level of evil has filled up. The cup of their evil is full, and he's going to bring judgment against them. He didn't do it until the time of Joshua when they came into the land of milk and honey. But that was their, that was the Canaanites' foothold, and they were an evil people. All that time demonstrates God's perseverance and his patience while he's preparing his people to go in and achieve what he wants for them. So that's the big picture. You take it down to our lives And you are also in the journey of perseverance. And what has gotten you to this place, you're going to need more to go to the next place. You have to grow, and Joshua is a perfect example of it. He was about 33 years old or thereabouts when Moses came into the picture and performed the, nine, the 10 plagues, the 10 things, 10 miracles to the Egyptians to let the Jewish people go, to let the Israelites go. So this guy Joshua had heard about a long time, because it goes way back, that God was going to give them prosperity, but he never saw any of it. His first 33 years or so of life, he lived as a slave. He knew what that was like. He had experienced it. He knew the bondage he was in. He knew the trouble he was dealing with. Then he witnessed this guy Moses come along and say he's going to deliver the people and do these things to the Egyptians until they released the people. And Joshua went with them. And then immediately they go to the Red Sea and he started to see God do miracle after miracle, the red parting of the Red Sea, the speaking to them out of the cloud and, and the, the, the clouds during the day and the fire at night to light up the place. And he heard God's voice from the mountains. He became Moses' number one assistant. And two years into his journey with the Lord, which was really through Moses, because he didn't really know the Lord. He was watching Moses. 
He is sent as one of the spies to spy out this land that was going to be theirs. He comes back, and some of you know the story, and he comes back and he says, hey, it's a good land. We should go get it. We should do this thing and take the land. 38 years pass, and they don't own one foot of that territory. That's a long persevering in faith. During this 38 years, Joshua led the military to a, great, to a great victory over the Amalekites when Moses was on the mountain holding up his hands, and every time he held them up, Joshua and the army was winning. Every time he got tired and put his arms down, Joshua and the army were being defeated. And so they finally got people to hold up Moses' arms so that Joshua could get the He was there. Joshua was on the mountain when God spoke to Moses and gave him the Ten Commandments. Joshua was there. Joshua came up to the mountain when God had a feast for all the leaders. Joshua was there. When Mo Joshua was with Moses, when he heard this yelling and this partying down the mountain, and when he goes with Moses down the mountain, that's where Aaron had made the golden calf. He witnessed all that. He was the one that stood in front of the tabernacle, the, the, the holy place, not even the tabernacle, the tent of meeting, where Moses would go into this tent before they had the ability to build the whole sanctuary, the whole tabernacle. It was just a tent, and that's where God would meet. Joshua stood in front of it. He was always in the presence of what God was doing. And so the book of Genesis talks about this land. The book of Exodus talks about this 40-year journey in the desert to the land. The book of Numbers talks about um, how the people were reacting during this particular time in history. See, everybody lives in a particular time of history. You're in this time of history. And there is junk all around us too. And there is a call for us to be that light in the darkness. We're no different. So looking back at his life, we're going, wow, this dude. In the book of Deuteronomy, which is the next book, talks about Moses' last words. It's the, called the Deuteronomy means second law. So when they get to the border of this land that they're supposed to get, Moses in the book of Deuteronomy reiterates all these things. This is what you need to do. This is what we need to do. This is how we need to live. Why? Because they're going into a new level. They're going to settle down and own property. They never owned property before that. None of those people ever owned a home. They had tents. They never owned property to have farms and to have a city of their own. They never had any of that stuff. And God is telling them, I'm going to take you into There's a whole other level of faith that has to take place. It's the same thing in your journey. Where you're at right now, great, and God has done things in your life. But where God is taking you, it's going to require resources from God that you don't possess at this time. God gives you what you need when you need it. You know, how many times, have you ever thought about, wow, if I had to die, if they ever came in, the government ever came in and said, if you don't profess Jesus, or if you profess Jesus, we'll kill you. Some of you have thought about that. Apparently, he has. <laughs> but this is, you know, could we do that? Or if you don't accept Jesus, I mean, accept Jesus, I'm sorry. If you don't renounce Jesus, I'll kill your kid. I'll kill your husband. I'll kill your wife. We'll, we'll take care of them. Would we have the faith to do that? Well, see, right now, you don't need that resource. There's no need for it. God is efficient he gives us what we need to deal with today. All the resources you need to deal with where you're at today are available. You have to be willing to tap in, and sometimes tapping into that is not our liking. But still, that's the resource he's providing. I believe if we ever came to that place, God would give you the power to do what you need to do. He'll always provide the resources we need. 
So he'll always provide where you're at, but to go forward, there has to go to a new level of faith, a new level of hope, a new level of persevering. And this is where we run into trouble. So in Deuteronomy, the book before what we're going to look at a little bit today is Joshua, but the book before that is Moses telling the people what they need to do as they get ready to enter this land, and he tells them, I'm not going to take you there. Joshua is. Now, it's one thing to be told you're going to do something. It's a whole other thing to do it, right? How many of us have aspirations? Some of you in here are single people. I just want to get married. I just want to get married. As soon as you're married, oh, my God. (laughs) There's a level of grace you need before. There's a level of faith and grace you need after. How many of you, before, any of you people that have had kids? Oh, you're reading every book. I bought two books of names. We're scouring names for the little angel. Kids two and a half years old. I think we got the wrong kid. (laughs) Amen? Called and doing two different things. I told my mom many a times, I'm, I'm going to quit dope. I'm not, I, I'm not addicted. I can quit anytime I want. She goes, well, quit then. I just don't want to. But when I quit, that was a whole new world. That was a whole new... Now I had to deal with Joe in ways I never had to deal with Joe. And boy, I'll tell you what, I needed resources. So we get this guy, Joshua. So let's jump into Deuteronomy 31. When... Moses gathers all the people, and he says, okay, this is what we're going to be doing. This is where we're going to be heading, and this is what you need to remember. In Deuteronomy 31.1, it says, when Moses had finished giving these instructions to all the people of Israel, he gave them a bunch of instructions. He said this, I am now 120 years old, and I am no longer able to lead you. The Lord has told me you will not cross the Jordan River. But the Lord your God himself will cross over ahead of you. So now there's a shift going on. These guys have had faith in Moses sometimes. But they have followed Moses for 40 years. And God's telling you, I'm moving Moses out of the way. At some point in your walk, it's a you and God walk. Everybody has a Moses or somebody in their lives that they hang on to. And there, when that person gets removed and our walk, with, it takes, goes to a whole nother level. So he says, listen, God is going to be with you guys. He will destroy the nations living there, and you will take possession of their land, and Joshua will lead you across the river, just as the Lord promised. The Lord will destroy the nations living in the land, just as he destroyed Sahon and Og, the kings of the Amorites. The Lord will hand over to you the people who live there, and you must deal with them as I have commanded you. So be strong and courageous. Whenever you get an admonition in Scripture like this, be strong and courageous, that means you're going to be terrified and extremely discouraged. You'll lose your courage. You're fearful. So he tells the people this, and then he says, you guys need to be strong and courageous. Then he turns his attention He says, do not be afraid and do not panic before them. All these people you're going to come against, don't panic before them. One of the things we do around people is panic. How many of us have done things we don't want to because of fear of criticism? Fear of someone saying something to us. Fear of what people will think of us. There comes a point in your walk, well, that has to fall away. I remember when I got saved and also sober, I thought all my friends should get sober too and saved. So I made it a point to go to all of my friends and bring my Bible. I didn't know much about it, but I brought it anyway. And uh, I told them they need to get sober. They need to get right with God. They need to change. Not one of them did. Not one of them did. Why? A number of them did later. Not by me. I never led any of them to the Lord. But... Others did, but what was God doing? God says, Joe, I don't care. This isn't about them. We're not going as a team. And you're going to go because everybody's going to go because some of us have hindered our moving forward because we still want to hang on to those 
people that are detrimental to our lives. And we want God to do something in their life. Then I'll follow you. He wants you to follow him, whatever they're doing. And there comes that point where that's the deal. Will you follow him if nobody else is following him? Joshua was being told he'd follow him. Leading them, whole different ballgame. So the Lord says, people, you're going to be terrified. You're going to be scared. You're going to be discouraged. But don't be. I'm with you. And he says this. Then Moses called for Joshua. Josh, come on up here. And as all Israel watched, he said to him, be strong and courageous, for you will lead these people into the land that the Lord swore to their ancestors he would give them. You are the one who will divide it among them as their grants of land. He says, not only will you lead them, you will be in, you'll be the boss. You'll divide the land up amongst the tribes and give each tribe their portion. Before he did anything, he said, be strong and courageous. Why? He's going to be scared to death. I guess I'm hammering that point today. What God has for you next, if you're not scared, you're not paying attention. If, if, you, if, if one of the things we learn in persevering with God is how limited our resources are. And how many other voices we listen to. So he says, you're going to do this. And then immediately after that in verse 8, he says, do not be afraid or discouraged. Don't be afraid or discouraged about that. For the Lord will personally go ahead of you. Oh, it's going to be a personal thing. It's going to be a you and God thing. They're going to be the benefit, but it's really a you and God thing. He will be with you. And he will neither fail you nor abandon you. Well, that's what Jesus said in Matthew 28 when he said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. That's the promise God has made to us in the land he's calling you to possess. And I always talk about the first land God calls you to possess is you. Control this thing. Control this and you'll be able to move forward. You can't control you. What's it matter what's out there? Does, it doesn't matter. And if you think Susie Cream Cheese or Bobby Bitchin's gonna save you, <laughs> it ain't gonna happen. Or you think that job is your answer? That job ain't your answer, it's a job. If God brings you to it, there's a purpose in it. You're going to need resources. How many have thought they've hit their dream job only to find out really quickly it's a freaking nightmare? How many have ran from one group of people because they ain't right, and the next group of people you find is they ain't right? Maybe it's you. You have to be strong and courageous to look at yourself and possess this territory. And I have to possess it today. And that gives me the strength to move forward. He said, he'll personally go ahead of you. He will be with you and he will ne neither fail you nor abandon you. Then the Lord commanded Joshua, son of Nun, with these words. Third time he's going to tell him. Be strong and courageous. For you must bring the people of Israel into the land I swore to give them. And I will be with you. Now, when we move forward into the book of Joshua, with, which follows these words, three times in the first number of verses, he's told that again, be strong and courageous. So this guy obviously was wet in his pants about the whole deal. He was scared. Even though for 40 years in the desert, he was Moses' guy. And he saw all the things Moses did. He participated in battles. He even won battles. He heard God's voice. He saw God do these miraculous things. That was beautiful for them because it will count. It will count to give him some faith when he struggles with what's next. But the bottom line is Moses ain't going to be there and he's got to go to what's next. 
It don't matter, man. I don't care how old you are. It's time to quit blaming mom and dad. I understand they can mess you up as well as be a great blessing. But at some point, you got to own yourself and go, mom and dad did this, or he did that, or she did that, or this is what happened. And those things happen, and they can be tragic and, 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 and terrible. But I have to own my own healing. I have to own my own, what do I do with my life now? What am I going to do? So, not only was Joshua going to the next level, the people were going to the next level, and God was well aware of this. So we jump. Well, let, let's, let's stay in Deuteronomy for a minute and look at what Moses tells them as he continues to get them ready to go in the land. He says, now you guys, in Deuteronomy 4.32, ask about the former days. Ask what God has already done in your life. Everybody in here, God has done some stuff in your life. Long before your time, from the day God created man on the earth, go back and let's take a look at what God has done. Ask from one end of the heavens to the other, has anything so great as this ever happened? Or has anything like it ever been heard of? Has any other people heard the voice of God speaking out of fire on this big mountain as you have and lived? Has any God, little g, ever tried to take for himself one nation out of another nation by testings, by miracles, miraculous signs and wonders? In other words, they conquered the Egyptians. You saw that. And he's taken you out of that bondage and made you into a special people when you were tagged and bagged. Has any other God ever done that? He says, has any God ever tried to take for himself one nation out of another nation by testings, by miraculous signs and wonders, by war, by a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, or by great and awesome deeds like all the things the Lord your God did for you? In Egypt, before your very eyes, you were shown these things so that you might know that the Lord is God and besides him there is no other. You might, he did this so that you would recognize him as God. Why would you want to remember that? Because you're going to need to remember that in the future. That's why your stories are important and the ability to see God in them. Because he said he'll never leave us nor forsake us. He didn't leave nor forsake them. Even in that place, he still had his hand upon them. And we need that in our lives. We need to grasp that. You were shown these things so that you might know that the Lord is God and besides him there is no other. From heaven, he made you hear his voice to discipline you, to train you. On earth, he showed you his great fire and you heard his words from out of the fire because he, because he loved your forefathers and chose their descendants after them. He brought you out of Egypt by his presence and his great strength to drive out before you nations greater and stronger than you and to bring you into their land to give it to you for your inheritance as it is today. Now, that's what he did for them, and that was a particular time in history, but he's also doing similar things in your life. He's also taking you from territory to territory to increase your life and show that he is God to you so that you may show that God is alive to others and that we may take territory. One day, God is going to come back and claim the whole earth and judge all the evil. But in the meantime, he is using his kids to influence territories and people, which are territories, around us into the kingdom. He is using us to draw people out of darkness, just like he did them. Much smaller scale most of the time, but nonetheless. So your spheres of influence are important, and you need to be courageous. How many of us have thought about sharing Jesus or sharing a part of our story with someone, and fear of criticism caused us to step back? Fear of what they would think. How many of us never, how many of us, your friends at work would never even know you're a Christian? You've never shared one thing. How many of you, when they're gossiping, including me, when someone's gossiping or beating somebody down and you go, you know, I just don't really want to hear that. 
even though in our heart we really don't want to hear that, we don't want to be a part of that, but we don't say nothing, and we don't leave because we don't want them to, I don't want to be the oddball. And for some of us, we've been, you know, when some of us look back at our history, in certain areas of our life, we didn't care if they knew we thought we were crazy. How many did insane things? But when it comes to Jesus, I, but, whoa. It's all I can do to praise him, praise, <laughs> praise him. We, you know, we're very controlled. You know, we're not going to let anybody really know. How many of you sitting here today worried about people? How many like to sit in the back row because you don't want anybody sitting behind you judging you? How many don't sit in the front row because you don't want to be that close? <laughs> How many come here because, you know, there's a fine lady that, lives, that keeps going to that church? <laughs> <laughs> Hey, if you're going to find a fine lady, church is probably a good place to start. We found them other places, and they weren't that fine. (laughs) And vice versa. So the people, as they get ready to go, Moses is reminding them of what God has already done. So you have something to lean on, something to build your faith to go forward. If he did that, which we would consider impossible, I could probably do what I now consider impossible. Some of you have that idea about going to school or to get a trade or to learn something new. I, it's, it was diff, you know, I, I, God, I'd rather fail and say I tried something that was on my heart than to never try and just fail anyway. At least I can look back and say I, I, I tried. But man, when we knock ourselves off before we even try, that's a horrible, horrible thing. And I've shared it with you guys last week. There's so many people I know that, you know, school was a terrible thing for them. But once they started going to school as a 40-year-old, they flourished. They can't even believe how good a student they are. That they're good at this. Anybody in here done, done something like that? How many people stop going into management because I don't want to boss people, you know, I don't want to, I don't know, I don't. Then you get into management, you go, oh, this is pretty good. Besides, I make more money. This is a good thing. And my ideas aren't that bad. I used to judge my ideas crazy, thinking like, wow, this was nuts. I remember starting this church, going to the place of really moving towards recovery, life recovery, and thinking, man, I don't know, man. This, I think this would work. I think this would draw people in from that world, my world. But nobody else is doing it like the way I'm thinking doing it. And, uh, you know, that's risky. But then the Lord spoke to me and said, oh, bless me if I go. Bless me if I stay. Do it, you know, do what you want. Do what you, what's on your heart. And you know what the crazy thing is? He brings people that are like-hearted to you. You you guys are amazing people. You You are gifted. There's a plan and a purpose for your lives. And if nobody's ever told you that, I'm telling you that. You're in this generation for a reason. And it doesn't even matter how old you are. Because you know what was taking place in Deuteronomy at this point? You know how old Joshua was? If he was around 33 years old when he got out of bondage and spent the next 40 years in the desert, and then God calls him to lead the people, he's a minimum 74, 73, 75, 78 years old. He's an old dude. And now he gets his big break. So for you oldies in here, your big break might be coming. <laughs> You 40-year-olds, hey, you ain't even there yet. Look, I, I believe what Scripture says. It says for a number of people, the latter years were much more productive than the former years. You know at where I'm at right now? I want my latter years to be more productive than my former. Why? Because the former's done. If you look back and go, that was the highlight of my life. What's the rest of this? The downward slide into the grave. 
I don't want that to be my life. I want to, I want to, you know, I want to go out slugging. You know, I don't know if I will, but if you know, if I'm laying in bed and I can't do anything, I told Teresa, put a pillow over my head and let's just call it a day. <laughs> anyway, so he tells them these things. Then he tells them in verse 39, I believe we're there. Acknowledge and take to heart this day that the Lord is God in heaven above and on the earth below. There is no other. So what's his final summation? Keep the decrees and commands. Keep what you understand about God. Hold on to that. He says, which I am giving you today, because he's giving them the law again, the second law, all the Ten Commandments and all the stuff. He gave it to them in Exodus. He's going to give it again in, in Deuteronomy so that they are refreshed in what they need to know. He says, so that it may go well with you and your children after you and that you may live long in the land the Lord your God gives you for all time. These are the commandments the Lord proclaimed in a loud voice to your whole assembly. He says, what I'm telling you to follow, these commands you heard with your ears because this God spoke it from the mountain and everybody heard it. That's crazy. We've never seen that. He says, there are the, there, loud voice to your whole assembly there on the mountain from out of the fire, the cloud and the deep darkness. And he added nothing more. Then he wrote them down on two stone tablets and gave them to me to bring down them. You heard it, and he gave it to you in written form. Well, you and I have God's word in written form again today. And these words. So that takes us to the place of Joshua praying after this point in time, and he's talking to God, and there's a conversation that takes place. And this is covered in Joshua 1, which is the book about Joshua's exploits. He says this, and After the death of Moses, the Lord's servant, the Lord spoke to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' assistant. You need to remember that word, those two words, Moses' assistant. Up to this point, he was always Moses' assistant. God has to transform him, and that is going to take more time into a servant of God, into someone who follows God, not through somebody, not behind somebody, but because they follow God. And so he said, Moses, my servant is dead. Therefore, the time has come for you to lead these people. Remember, he's in his 70s most likely. The Israelites across the Jordan River into the land I am giving them. Now is the time. All your journey has brought you to this place. And this place counts, just like all your journey counted. He says, I promise you what I promised Moses. Wherever you set your foot, you will be on land I have given you. And that's what I meant earlier today when I said to you guys, the, you possess yourself first. Possess the land God gives you. Draw a circle around yourself, that's your land. Possess that well, God will increase. From the Negev wilderness in the south to the Lebanon mountains in the north, from the Euphrates River in the east to the Mediterranean Sea in the west, including all the land of the Hittites. That don't mean a lot to me, you and I, in the sense of, okay, it's a big chunk of land. But remember, these guys didn't own a foot of land. They had not an inch of territory, and he's naming these expanses of land that are going to be theirs. That's an impossibility to even wrap your head around. No wonder he's afraid. No wonder he's going to struggle with courage. He's never experienced that. You know, when you're going forward in life and you're going to experience things all the time, they're new things. You're going to experience new things, things you haven't experienced before. That's what oftentimes makes us so scared. New is always scary, is it not? New is always scary. So he says, listen, you're going to go into something you've never done, but listen, I'll be with you, and I'll provide you what is needed. He says, no one will be able to stand against you as long as you live. 
For I will be with you as I was with Moses, and I will not fail you or abandon you. So he tells them, basically repeating what Moses said. So he tells them in verse 6, be strong and courageous, for you are the one who will lead these people to possess all the land I swore to their ancestors I would give them. Be strong and very courageous, and be careful to obey the instructions Moses gave you, the Ten Commandments. Do not deviate from them, turning either to the right or to the left. Why? Then you will be successful in everything you do. That will keep you on track. Turning to the left or right, as we oftentimes say here, going sideways, turning to the left or right takes you off the path. So he says, these words that I give you are borders. If you stay in them, you will continue to move forward in all that the promises offer you. But that's the key, stay in them. And that's where it's going to take faith and courage. Because a lot of times, it doesn't sound like God's doing it. This isn't the way to do it. Anybody ever not understand what God is doing? Not know what he's doing, not know where he's going, not know what his thinking is? That's par for the course. He's God. He's God. So, study this book of instruction continually, he says. Meditate on it day and night, and you will be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. So here's the primer. That's the if and then then. And you know, the thing about God's commands, there's the things don't do, and then there's the things to do, and then there's the blessings that come. Or the problems that come. This is my command, he says. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged. Three times he tells him that. So this is six times in a short period of time. Anybody ever say anything to God? Enough already. I got it. Be strong and courageous. Joshua, no, you don't. I'm telling you this, but you're going to experience it. And you're going to have to remember that I'm with you always. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. So all of this was given to Joshua when he was the servant of Moses. Never before had he had to follow God in this kind of way. Moses followed God, and he followed behind Moses. Moses has been removed. Now he must follow God. That's a whole new ball of wax. And anyone in here that says, like we sang earlier, I want to follow God, it's a personal deal. And not everybody's going to agree with it. And maybe people in your own household don't agree with it. That has nothing to do with nothing. I have to follow God because that's what I have to do. And if people don't like it, then they don't like it. What's that have to do with anything? So let's recap for what Joshua needs to do to succeed and what, his must, and what his perspective must be as he journeys forward into this new level of persevering. One, number one, he must own the call. I must follow God. He is the one and you must own your call. Everyone in here has not only been saved, you've been called. You must own that. God has a plan for me. I may not know what it is, but I can know this. I can know what I'm supposed to do today. I can know that. And I can make plans for the future. Whether those all come to pass, I don't know, but I can make plans and I can move towards that. God is able to direct you. Don't be that person that says, I got to know exactly what God wants. Do I eat a hamburger today? Do I eat a hot dog today? Do I have the awful salad today? Because there are some Christians, like, well, God hasn't spoke to me. And you know what I tell them? What's on your heart? What would you like to do? What are you gifted at? What do you want to do? God gave us that ability too. You know, when he's talking to Joshua here, he didn't tell him how he was going to wage war. He didn't tell him how they were going to plant plants. 
He didn't tell them any of that. So why? He didn't need to know that. What's their first battle? First of all, the Jordan dries and they go across it, so it's another crossing. And then he takes them into a city of Jericho. And he says, this is what you need to do. You need to walk around it seven times a day, seven days in a row, or something like that. I forget exactly. <laughs> but it was, it was weird. It was a weird way to do battle. Now, that's a step of faith. When you're following God, pretty much everything he tells you is weird, is, 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 a diff, is difficult, is not, doesn't make sense. Okay, second thing he says, he says, Josh, own the call. Second one, believe the Lord. Believe that I'll be with you as I was with Moses. You have that experience. You saw me with him. You're moved into that spot. I'm gonna be with you. Don't forget that. I am with you. Joshua saw this in action for 40 years, and that is his human example of God's faithfulness. You know, we need people in our lives who are faithful to God so we can learn by their actions how to walk in faith. If you don't have anybody in your life that is farther down the faith journey than you, that's, that's going to be a problem to you. That's why being part of a community is a big deal because we have those that are beginning the journey. We have those that are still in bondage that are just entering into freedom. We have those that have passed through the wilderness and have learned to navigate the wilderness. We have those that have entered into what God's call is for them, like Joshua is now. We have, there's people all along that path. I always say, man, as we move forward, you hold on to the person behind you and you grab someone uh, in front of you and you grab someone behind you. That's how it works. If I don't have that, pity the man or woman who has nobody to hold on to. No example. Many of us have had bad examples. How many of us have had great examples of bad examples? How many of us has been them? Well, that's all part of the journey too. So we learn even from the devastating things in our life as we learn from the great things. And so we can learn to move forward. So he says this, God will be with them just like that, and he believes, believe because you have seen it. Let's go to number three. Third thing he tells them is obey God's command. Obey God's word that you know. Three times he tells them to be strong and courageous. Why? To persevere, he would need to be strong and courageous because fear will seek to make him quit. And if he does stay strong and courageous, he will overcome his fears. It's a big, big deal. He is told to obey the word as revealed to Moses and written down. And he tells him to meditate on it daily. Why? Because we meditate on a lot of other words. What do you meditate on daily? Because that sets the direction of where you're go, going. If I understand, if I meditate that, I can be strong, very courageous. Because these things were written down. If I meditate on that, that God will be with me. He is with me. He will help me. He will show me what I need to do. God, show me. And God shows you. It may not be like you expect. And the answer may not be the answer you want or thought would happen. But an answer is coming. And then you need to walk in it. And then the third one, he is told to obey the word revealed to Moses. Oh, I just said that one. So that's what he has. And our numbers are all messed up here, but don't worry about that. You might want to take some pictures of these things so you can meditate on them. Or better yet, read Joshua. <laughs> and meditate on that. Then he tells them, these things you'll succeed in. If you do this, know that I'm with you. Stay strong and courageous. Meditate on my word. Keep moving forward. You'll be successful. But this will hold you back. And he gives them a couple things that will hold him back. He says, this will stop you. This will hinder your life. Being afraid, which is, which is the connotation in that is being terrified. It's being, 
in our mindset, frozen stiff. He says, if you allow fear to take you, you will stop, you will run, you will get off the track. You will become immobile and you'll be consumed with catastrophic imaginations. We will either meditate on that stuff, as I shared with you earlier, or we will meditate on what God says. I will listen to voices that build me, or I will listen to voices that destroy me. You know, they did a psychological study. They say for every one positive a person hears, they hear nine negatives. And who tends to dwell on the negatives? How many sit around going, wow, that person really said a beautiful thing to me? Most of the time, we even minimize that. Ah! Oh, yeah, I could have done better. Hey, you did a great job. Well, it wasn't that great. It's like, receive a blessing. Receive a blessing. And then be a blessing. How many of us have been afraid to tell people a word of encouragement because we don't want their heads to blow up? Okay, so then we should keep their heads real small. Minimize their stuff. And I shared with you guys last week, celebrate victories. Celebrate some victories. You did well today? Celebrate that. Someone you love did well? Someone you see did well? Celebrate that. My wife is great at that with the kids. I really like the way you did whatever it was. It's like, nobody ever said that to me. I'd show them a drawing when I was a four-year-old, and they'd go, wow, you can't stay in the lines, can you? It's like, I used blue. Blue I used. <laughs> know what level people are at. Celebrate the victory. I know, I know somebody that recently, you know, fell off the wagon. You don't fall off. You usually jump off. But, um, and, and this person was told that although they had this amount of time, years of sobriety, because they did this, all that doesn't count. I said, that's an absolute lie. That's an absolute lie. All that counts. Good for you. You did that. Good for you. Now get back up and know this. You ran into something that sidetracked you. You're going to run into it again. Be ready to deal with it this time. Deal with it differently. Because you're going to deal with it, just deal with it healthily. You know, celebrate victories. So he said, don't be afraid and be courageous. And so what's the second one? Don't give in to discouragement. Don't allow yourself to be deterred. Talked out of moving forward either by words or hindering circumstances or opposition. Don't lose courage. Stay there. He said, if you, do, if you don't if you walk in fear and you, don't walk in, and you walk in courage, you'll be okay. You'll make it. And the third one and the last one being, don't fail to study the word of instruction. Study it. And know this, God will never leave you nor forsake you. The word of instruction is God is with you. He's done it, Joshua all the way from Genesis. He was promising these people a place, and you're the one to take it in, take them in. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years later, it's okay, you're gonna do it. Just like I've led them, I'm gonna lead you. So my friends, I tell you the same thing. And this is what happened. Remember I told you in Joshua 1, where he said, hey, Josh, you're Moses' assistant. Toward the end of the book in Joshua Chapter 24, the Lord speaks and it says this. After this, Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110. Whoa! He went from being Moses' assistant to owning his position as a servant of the Lord in his generation. So listen for you guys. We are either serving the Lord as servants or we're somebody's assistant. We're working our way there. And both places are valuable and anything in between. 
The perseverance in faith made him well-rounded to be called a servant of God. And that only took time to get. He had to lead those people. And if he died at 110, and he took these guys in and led them at about 75, how many years is that? 25, 35 years. Possibly even 40 if you go back a few years. He led them for 40 years. Imagine what he learned in that. He learned to trust God in a way he had never trusted him before. He had learned his capabilities. He had learned how to be a leader in a way he never did before. He learned those things, but everything else in his life brought him to that point. So here's the thing for you guys. Why don't we stand up? You're at somewhere on the timeline of your walk with God. You're somewhere there. Embrace that. And realize for you to go to the next place, it's going to require resources beyond your capability. So you need to meditate on the word. You need to be courageous and not fearful. You need to own your walk. It ain't about anybody else. It's about you. And you need to do the do in the territory you now possess, however big or however small that territory is. Some of us may be in early recovery and, and trying to control yourself is the biggest deal. Others of us, God has added to us people, relationships, property, stuff, a job, whatever it is. That's all expansion of the territory. And you have a responsibility in all of that to handle it well, and you will face fears. But be strong and courageous and do what you need to do today. How many know that? All right, let me pray for you. And you, well, you know what? Pray along with me. Lord Jesus. Help me to own the territory you have given me today. Help me to be strong and courageous. Give me a hunger for your word that I may have strong boundaries so that I can stay on path and use me as your servant in my generation to do good. And all those who prayed that say amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a great day.